Okay, uh, thank you, members. Um, just a quick announcement before we start the uh, the meeting properly. Um, as our chair is still uh, not fully recovered from his uh, recent um, illness, I will be acting as chair tonight. Councillor Davis will be present. However, uh, in case he is unable to stay for the duration of the meeting and in order to provide continuity for members, I will be taking all the chair responsibilities for this evening at the start of the meeting. That's OK. I'd like to meet, uh, welcome all members to the Environmental and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee held today on Microsoft Teams. <clears throat> this meeting will be recorded and made available to, to view via the Council website, except for discussions involving confidential and exact items. Therefore, the images, audio of those individuals speaking will be publicly available at all via the recording of the Council website at www.capilli.gov.uk. The first uh, item on the agenda is to receive apologies. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we've received apologies from Councillor Priest, Councillor Scriven and Councillor Julian Simmons. And also, C Councillor Ellsbury did uh, advise that he might be uh, a little bit late. He's hoping to join, but um, he, he's running a bit late at the moment, Chair. OK. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> um, just like to remind, remind members uh, to keep their microphones on mute and only unmute when they are making a contribution to the meeting. Please note that the, the Chair or Vice Chair should keep their cameras and microphones on throughout the meeting. Also advise that attendees wishing to contribute should click on the hands up button on the control bar and a hand symbol will appear, disappear next to their person's name notifying that they wish to speak. Advise members that today we will be using Microsoft Forms for voting on agendas three, five, seven and nine. A poll will appear on members' screens and you will be asked to click on either for, against, or abstain. And the final click on submit button. The vote will stay open for 30 seconds, but we will appreciate that it is that the new to new members and a little more time may be needed. Any members joining by form will be asked to, to state the, their vote. That's okay. Uh, declarations of interest. Councillors and officers are reminded of their personal responsibilities to declare any personal and or presidential interest in respect to any items of business on this agenda in accordance with the Local Government Act 2000, Council's Constitution and the Code of Conduct on both councillors and officers. Has anybody got any uh, declarations to uh, put forward? Okay, thank you. Next item on the agenda is to approve the uh, minutes of the last environmental screening committee held on the 14th of September. A clarification on page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, and page seven. Will somebody move the recommendation? Somebody move the minutes, please. Yep, happy to move. Um, and a second, please. I'll, I'll second, uh, Chair. I did put my hand up to ask us, as I've been the uh, the chair at the previous meeting uh, on a temporary basis, should I be the uh, accepted as the mover? But uh, that's already been done, so I'm happy to second. Okay, thank you, thank you, Councillor Adams. Item number four: Consider any matters referred to the committee in accordance with the calling procedures. Sorry, chair. We just go to the vote now on the. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, it should be on member screens yeah. now. Thank you, Chair. I'll be abstaining, Mark, because um, I wasn't actually at the meeting. OK, Chair.
Mark? Mark? Yeah. I, ca I can't put in for absence because I uh, abstain, sorry. I was only part of the meeting. I can't get in. Okay, Councillor Davis, I'll put you down as an abstention. <coughs> That's carried, Chair, with um, five abstentions, including Councillor Davis on the phone. Thank you, Mark. OK, we we'll go on to uh, item number four, considering any matters referring to the committee in accordance with the call-in procedures. Is there any call-in, Mark? You know? No, nothing's been called in, Chair. OK, thank you. Item five, Environmental and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee Forward Working Programme. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Members are asked to consider the forward work programme alongside the cabinet work programme as appended to the report and to suggest any changes. Um, I'd just like to bring to members' attention, there was a request received from Councillor Dix to have a report on domestic electric charging points added to your um, forward work programme. Um, obviously, he's not a, a member of the committee but um, he has requested that, um, that such a report comes forward. Um, and the advice from officers at this stage is that um, the council is working on a Cardiff city region basis um, regarding this, uh, in this area. And they, um, they, they have put in a challenge fund bid. So the advice at this stage is we wait for the outcome of the challenge fund bid before we consider doing any reports on, on this area. So uh, if members are happy, um, I would like to seek approval to publish the Environment and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee Forward Work Programme um, to the, um, onto the Council's website. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll be with that, um, Mark. So. And we also have uh, Mark Williams with his hand up, Chair. Hello, Mark. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, just um, picking up on Mark's point about the CCR Cardiff Capital Region Challenge Fund bid. So the Challenge Fund is a fund uh, within the Cardiff Capital Region to solve problems or potential problems that are, are regional or possibly national significance, obviously, charging charge points for terraced houses, high-rise properties, student accommodation, you know, va various house types that, that we see particularly across the valleys and cities um, present some challenges because A, there is no guarantee that you can park on the street, there are issues around safety of, of cables trailing. So, you know, it is something that we are looking to, at, at the market to, to assist with in terms of, of, of a challenge. It is something that over time, you know, many local authorities um, and central government will have to solve if we're going to move to electric vehicles, because obviously many, many properties are terraced or high rise. Um, so to bring a report forward in advance of that challenge, Bill, I feel is a little premature, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, OK, thanks, Mark. Mike Adams. Thank you, Chair. I, I actually thought Mark then was going to mention to very auspicious that today, of course, the Welsh Government has brought out its own report about how Wales as a nation needs to uh, move forward with all of this. Um, and uh, yeah, that's going to be coming to us as well as a an authority and the, the Cardiff City Region, I'm sure. And there will be very comprehensive uh, replies to that report on how we can add to the, the progress. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mike. OK, Mark. OK, Chair, so if we can get someone to move and second the um, forward work programme and then we can put that to the vote. Can we get somebody to uh, move and second that, please? Oh, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and again, I'll second that, Councillor Adams. Thank you. OK, Mark, can we go to the vote? Should be on your screens now, members.
That's carried unanimously, Chair. 11 for and no against and no abstentions. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, we go on to uh, item number six to receive and consider the following cabinet reports. Is there any um, cabinet reports brought forward, uh, Mark? No, Chair. None of the reports listed were brought forward for this meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, we come to uh, item number seven, notice of motion, nine, nine, nine mile point uh, planning decisions. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Councillor Heveridge. Uh, Councillor, you've got five minutes to uh, to put your notice of motion, and um, I'll give you a thirty minute beep if uh, thirty second beep if you were if you were going over. Thank you. Okay, th thank thank you, Councillor Hezzy. Um, appreciated for al allowing me to speak to the notice of motion. Um, the notice of motion actually speaks for itself. It gives actual details of. Um, the concerns, which is signed by myself and um, a number of Plaid Cymru members. Um, in regard, the what I'd like to say is, in in regard these matters, I I believe that you know, and I think you all agree with me, a scrutiny committee's function is to actually look at all the evidence, all the meaningful. Um, consultation and I just like to refer the scrutiny committee to um, there's a number of meetings which have taken place uh, with Howell which formerly has REM that was taking place a number of weeks ago there was meetings taking place with officers with NRW on the 27th of September um, I've had to file freedom of information requests to get them meetings uh, and discussions. I haven't had them yet. So really, you know, we I'm operating a bit in, in the dark here. Now, just for the, the, the committee's um, information, um, the problem was the um, the leader made a made a speech at council uh, and, and there was no questions saying that there would be an internal investigation. That would be a phase two investigation and if they if people weren't happy, they could go to the ombudsman. Now, I've always argued members that there should be a public inquiry and there should be an independent member outside the council actually looking at this. Now, that is no disrespect to, to Richard Edmonds because the the actual site has been so controversial. I think in regard openness and transparency, we need an independent person. Just to, to let the committee know, on the 22nd of October, uh, Richard Edmonds wrote a four page letter to Chris Evans, the member of parliament, saying he had concluded the phase two investigation. And um, there's a number of points in this letter and I'm disappointed because I don't think anybody on this scrutiny committee have seen the letter. The, the actual letter goes into the legal process, it goes into Hasram, it goes into the planning process, it mentions the EIA screening, it mentions Dr. Platt and it says that the council write to Howell asking that they meet with the community as quickly as possible, then that a residence liaison group is established. Now, that was the conclusions and it says, if people are not happy with stage two, they can go to the ombudsman. But I do feel, uh, Mr. Chairman, that the actual full page letter and the details involved here should have been given to the committee prior to this meeting so we can consider this notice of motion in a meaningful way. And I, I am disappointed in regard that. To conclude then, Mr Chairman, um, because the information, uh, and I, I appreciate you won't have seen all this, I didn't get this letter um, myself until this afternoon and it's dated the 22nd of October. So, you know, and if if people will say, well, Councillor Edridge, this is a complaint. 
this is not about your notice of motion, but there's there's information in you which the members of the scrutiny committee really need to consider before they vote. And I don't believe that any of you have seen it. On a final point then, I would like to ask somebody on the committee to move that we have a full public inquiry and we appoint an outside independent consultant to report on all matters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, thank you, Councillor Everidge. Is there anybody uh, going to propose this and second it? Bob Owen? Yes, I'd be happy to propose that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Hey, thank you, Bob. Chair, I'll second. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. We take, um, I think next now we've got uh, Dr. Platt. Oh, Mr. Chair. Hello, Mark. I've, I've, the vote had just come up and um, it has not been. Um, yes, I don't know why that as perhaps yeah. committee services can remove that forms, please. That shouldn't be there. Thank you. Members, if you can all press the small X at the top of the voting. Um, pop up that will close that from your screens and we will reissue that vote at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I think we got uh, Dr. Platt now. Dr. Uh, Platt, you've got uh, Sabres Councillor Everidge, you've got five minutes until a 30 second warning um, when you come in close to the time. Thank you. OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, members of the Scrutiny Committee. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak at your meeting. Um, if I spoke about every shortcoming I was aware of with this planning decision process, we'd be here for a good while. So you'd be, you'd be happy to learn. I'm only going to focus on a single issue at the heart of my recent failed application for a judicial review. Um, I believe one of the purposes of this committee is stated as to help improve the council's performance. And it's with that in mind that I'm going to try and address you this evening. Um, I live in Brunowal in the Sahawi Valley, about half a mile away from the, uh, the development, which is going to process about 100,000 tonnes of waste every year and turn it into fuel. My concern is it will have a detrimental impact on the environment that I share with my family and with my neighbours. I should point out I'm a mathematician by training, not a lawyer, definitely not a planner, so please bear with me. Um, first, though, I've got some unfortunately necessary legal background I, I, I need to take you through. Um, the Environmental Impact Assessment Regulations, so the EIA regulations, exist to identify developments that might have a significant environmental impact and to force the developers to carefully analyse that impact and put in place any mitigation that, they, that is seen to be necessary. The process starts with a screening where the local planning authority decide whether or not the development falls under EIA at all, and if it does, whether it's a Schedule 1 or a Schedule 2 development. If it's Schedule 1, then an EIA must be done. If it's Schedule 2, then it's at the discretion of the planning authority, depending on the likely impact, to decide whether or not an EIA is appropriate. Now, obviously, from a developer's point of view, an EIA is an expensive and time-consuming process. So our problems here start back in March 2015, which is when this development was screened for environmental impact assessment. Uh, Caffili planners at the time classified it as an industrial estate, which falls under Schedule 2, and they further decided that an EIA was not required. Unfortunately, this is not an industrial estate. It's a waste disposal plant. Mr. Wallbank, who is a senior solicitor with CCBC, finally admitted that to me and to the court in April 2020. I pointed this out to the planners back in October 2020, and I wrote to the chief executive in December 2020, explaining in detail why the original 2015 screening was wrong. Um, Ms. Kite, who I believe is head of planning, was asked to respond on CCB's behalf, 
and assured me it was not a waste disposal plant in writing on the 17th of December and again on the 5th of January and again in a team's meeting on the 19th of January and again on the 20th of January in writing. As I said, in April 2021, Mr. Warbank contradicted her. Earlier this month, and I'm alluding now to the, the letter that uh, Councillor Etheridge was speaking about from Mr. Edmunds, Mr. Edmonds, he told me that, quote, the council accepts that it is a waste disposal installation, unquote. He then went on to say, quote, and in any event, it doesn't make any difference for the reasons given above, unquote. Well, my barrister and I think it does actually make a difference, but we never got round to arguing that in court because the judicial review wasn't allowed. But in any event, I think Mr. Edmonds is missing the point here. It is not OK to make mistakes when you're dealing with environmental impact assessment regulations, even if you do, even if it does not make any difference, as he contends in this case. The EIA regulations are there to protect the environment and the public. CCBC cannot be seen to make blunders when applying it, even if they get lucky and get away with it. So I respectfully pose the following questions for, for, for this committee to give some thought to. First, how did CCBC fail to correctly identify the development as waste disposal, as is now admitted, back in 2015? Second, how did Ms. Kite, the most senior planner within CCBC, fail to recognise the error in 2020 and 2021, even though it was being pointed out to her? Why has she not since acknowledged her error? Three, why does Mr. Edmonds, who's a corporate director, think it's OK for CCB to make a blunder like this because he claims it made no difference this time? Surely you can see that sooner or later, a mistake like this will have consequences. Four, when faced with a genuine concern raised by a member of the public, CCBC's officers denied anything was wrong for six months until they were actually faced with court action. Even then, they hid behind the claim that it did not make any difference anyway. As a council taxpayer, I expect better. And finally, are CCB's admittedly small team of planners and lawyers really up to the job of determining complex cases such as this? Do we have any confidence they'll get the next one right? If they get it wrong, will it be in such a way as it, this, it makes absolutely no difference? Or will they get it wrong in a way that cannot be swept under the carpet? Um, that's Absolutely. all I have to say. Thank you, Chair. Okay, th uh, thank you, Dr. Platt. Just within the time as well. Okay, um, members, you're open to, uh, for discussion though on uh, on it. Uh, Councillor Adams, you've got your hand up. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Um, just a question. Is it correct that Mr. Platt will be allowed to answer any questions that are put to him from the committee? Um, I, th I think that's been agreed. Is that correct? I think I, I believe that's right, uh, Councillor Adams. Okie doke. Th thanks for that. Mr. Platt, Councillor Mike Adams, um, and I was a member of the, uh, that original planning committee, which actually visited the site on the appropriately site visit on the Monday before the application before came before the planning committee. Uh, and it was a very useful site. Uh, I've got a couple of questions to to ask. Uh, you may not be able to actually answer all of them. Um, but I, I have to say that much is made in the opinion of Ms. Townsend regarding waste recovery or waste disposal. Um, and as I read the opinion that uh, she's very, very comprehensively uh, uh, supplied to you, which you've copied to us. There's an awful lot of nomenclature there uh, on the differences between both and how they can be applied. And there's so much, uh, it'd be wrong to call it gobbledygook because that, that, that would be wrong, but it's very, very comprehensive set of wording that can allow people who want to believe one way or the other that it's recovery or its disposal. Um, so that can be confusing to many people who read all of that. And of course, we haven't got all of the, the EU uh, judgments uh, involved in that. 
So uh, that didn't make it easy for me. Um, and also, and this is probably for the planners, if any are, are here tonight, did the new application for extension of the five year limit become obsolete with the commencement of work within that five years? Uh, because so much is made of the 2020 application, but did it really matter? Did it come into play when work was started before that five years? And Mr. Platt, I have to ask, were you aware of the six week period for a judicial review before the judge used it to say no case to answer? Uh, which seemed sad, obviously, for you and uh, non conclusive, inconclusive for us. I don't know if there's anyone here who can answer all three of those questions. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor, I, I can certainly have a go if that's OK, Chair. Yes, sir. Um, in terms of disposal versus recovery, I mean, Councillor Adams is right to alight on this, this point, because I think this is where um, Ms. Kite was um, confused and was, was getting it wrong, not to put too fine a point on it. The, the bottom line is, though, that your senior solicitor, Mike Wallbank, has, has admitted now that my barrister's argument is correct and it is a waste disposal plant. It turns out, for various technical legal reasons, there is no such thing as waste recovery when it comes to EIA. There's a judgment which everybody refers to as Italy, which makes that absolutely clear. Um, now, to, to be fair to me, I did point that out to Ms. Kite, um, but you obviously didn't uh, didn't get it at the time. Um, you asked about the uh, the extension. Um, has Rem, as you as you correctly point out, requested a 12 month extension um, to their planning consent because it was due to run out on the 10th of December last year. In the event they were able to implement the planning or a week or two weeks before that deadline and therefore saw fit to pull the request for an extension because they, they determined they didn't need it any further. Um, but that wasn't the only thing that went through at the end of 2020. The reason they were able to start is Hasrem had got discharged um, in three brackets, or sorry, in three lumps, various pre-commencement conditions which the planning committee had imposed on them before they could start work. They managed to get rid of all of those just in time and on that basis were able to lawfully start construction. Had they not been able to do that in time, then I saw the 12-month extension was their backup. That was their, their belt and braces. So the things that... Um, the things that we tried to challenge in the judicial review were the original 2015 planning consent and those discharge of preconditions, because in our view, they should all have been subject to an EIA. Um, moving on to the, the, the question of time, um, again, Councillor Adams is right to point out that this the, uh, permission to have a judicial review was refused because we were out of time. We knew we were out of time before we asked for the judicial review, but the judge has the discretion to allow an extension if he sees fit. In this instance, he saw the um, commercial disadvantage that it would cause to Hasrem, well, Hewell as it is now, because they'd already started and they'd already let contracts. He felt that that was too extreme to allow an extension in this instance. So unfortunately, the one big legal issue which remains outstanding um, never got to court and never got, dis uh, never got discussed. So at the moment, as we sit here, we're all agreed it's a waste disposal plant. We've got that far. But I claim that because it does drying, it is also doing chemical treatment and CCB maintain the drying is not a form of chemical treatment. That's important because if it does chemical treatment, it's Schedule 1 and there is no debate, there must be an EIA. So that, that's where we differ at the moment, purely on that. And as Councillor Adams pointed out, we never got our day in court to decide which one of us was right. 
Thank you, Dr. Platt. It, it was important for me to know that you knew the six weeks may well be a big factor in whether or not this reached its conclusion. Um, that, that is important for both of us, obviously, that we know that. And, and yes, if the reason that the judge couldn't then carry it forward because he don't, in his mind you were saying he felt that the, the operator was going to lose too much money by him carrying on with the case, which didn't seem uh, very, very practical as far as I was concerned. Uh, there were many, many more questions that I might have asked if there'd been any chance of us being able to move forward. But from what uh, Councillor Etheridge has uh, come up with uh, this afternoon, I think uh, we, we may need to move forward on some different issues, to be honest. Thank you, Dr. Platt, for your information. Hey, thank and you, thank you as well for all of the many reams of uh, uh, sometimes uh, repeated information that you've given us from, from February onwards. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Councillor Adams and uh, Dr. Platt. Um, Mark Williams, put your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Platt just referred to the difference uh, in opinion between himself and the authority as to whether drying constitutes a chemical process. Just for the committee to be aware, Chair, that Highwell NMP, who are the, who are the new owners of the facility, have now submitted a non-material amendment to their planning permission on the basis that they will not be carrying out any drying at the facility. So, so there is no drying or chemical treatment being carried out. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Councillor Bob Owen. Yeah, thank you, Chair. A um, couple of things from me, really. Um, I've just proposed, obviously, on behalf of uh, Kevin Etheridge for the uh, Councillor Etheridge for the for the motion, but I think you you know, uh, and obviously uh, Councillor Adams there with a with a fair few questions and having quite a long history in it. Um, it's for me. I think this this is really we we really need to consider our conscience. Because you know, at, if if you look at it, I mean, we can go back to March when uh, the first emails came out to us as all members, and uh, you you know it was clear. Or you 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 know you you can't speak on this, you can't speak to residents. Don't do any of this. Don't do any of that. I questioned that, and of course, it wasn't that we couldn't. It was advice not to, but. Uh, it was almost like as if it was unofficial gagging. We moved on from that anyway, but clearly in the interim, while this was going on from February, March through to a later time where Dr. Platt alludes to, um, you, you know, time went on for uh, six months. And basically we come to a point there where in effect the, you, you, you know, the case run out of time. Now, from my point of view, as a as an elected member, we are here to serve residents, whether we're in that ward, any other ward. And to me, I'm I'm not happy with how this has panned out over the time. And as I say, I'm going to ask you to consider your consciences here as to having a, an assessment, you know, an independent um, internal investigation, which basically is not going to go deep deep enough. If we want if we want some real answers, I think we've got to go and have a public inquiry with somebody somebody leading this externally, and let's get to the bottom of it and let's see what somebody says externally. It's no good leaving it within, because within it seems that mistakes have been made, and I'm not going to mention names and the the, the different people that we've talked about here tonight, but. Within side, I feel that we, 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 we're not going to get uh, a proper investigation. And as Councillor Etheridge said, I, I'm not, um, you know, sort of decrying what um, Richard Edmonds is doing. That's because he's been asked to do the job and, and fair play, he's doing it. But I think we need to look at our consciences 
and say, do we want to get to the bottom of this? Do we really want to find out um, the, the full facts from a from an independent viewpoint? And that's why I proposed it. And that's why I think we should vote for an independent inquiry this evening. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mr. Owens. Uh, um, Mr. Williams, you want to come back in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to remind the committee, so what's happened with this um, is Richard Edmonds has conducted uh, an independent, because I'm the director with responsibility for you know, planning and a lot of the public services. Richard Edmonds is is divorced from that. So as a, as a kind of independent corporate director, he has reviewed this case and has replied to Dr. Platt. Obviously, you know, the mechanism in local government for an independent look at things is referral to the Ombudsman. And I know Mr. Edmonds' response to Dr. Platt has suggested that, you know, if Dr. Platt is not content with what uh, Mr. Edmonds has carried out, which, you know, I've, I've read it and it's pretty thorough, um, it was very thorough actually, then, you know, the, 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 indi the next step in terms of an independent outsider looking at this is the Ombudsman. That's the mechanism we have in local government uh, you know where people are not happy with with internal matters, so that option is is still there. Um, you know, and the the ombudsman may or may not look at it, um, but certainly in order to get to that point, it needs to be referred to the ombudsman if Dr. Platt is minded to do so. Thank you, Chair. Hey, okay, thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Councillor Owens, is that a legacy hand you got up, or? Uh, it's sort of part legacy, but uh, in listening to what um, uh, Mark Williams just said, like I just said as well, I fully understand that uh, you know we've we've looked at it, but okay, the ombudsman is the next stage, but I think um, an independent inquiry when something is fairly serious, uh, which I think this is and warrants it, there's got to be something above that, probably at government level. And I think that's where we should be going with this. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Owens. But, uh, <clears throat> Mark, do we need to go to the, the vote now? It has been uh, moved and seconded. Motion? That's right, Chair. The um, the the motion has been... Um, um, the, the, it, it, we, we asked if anyone was willing to move this motion. And um, it was um, moved by Councillor Bob Owen, seconded by John Roberts. So a poll is now on your screens uh, on whether or not you support the motion put forward um, by Councillor Etheridge. And could I just remind members as well and uh, those present that only um, committee members can vote on this. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank, thank you, Mark. Okay, members, the, the poll is open if you'd like to submit your votes. OK, Chair, so uh, over 30 seconds has uh, elapsed now and um, votes are in. Um, the uh, motion has fallen. Um, the, there's four votes for, seven votes against and there was one abstention, Chair. OK, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Councillor Etheridge and Councillor Owen, could you uh, please uh, lower your hands, please? My hands lowered, uh, Chair. Well, it looks to me that it is. It is. Yeah. It is. It is now. Councillor Owens, thank you. Councillor Owens, would you like to lower your hand, please? Yeah, mine's not working, Adrian. But obviously, okay, no. I'll okay, be leaving no. the meeting now anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Thanks very Thanks. much, uh, Councillor. 
Okay, members, I'd like to go on to um, agenda number eight, uh, the public space protection order, dog control on sports pitches. I think uh, Nigel George is uh, presenting this. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of the report is to update the scrutiny committee on the outcome of a 10 week public consultation regarding a proposed amendment to the public space protection orders to include the exclusion of dogs from marked sports pitches. Secondly, is to seek the scrutiny committee's views on the proposed amendment to public space protection orders to include the exclusion of dogs from marked sports pitches on a seasonal basis prior to presenting a draft order to cabinet for approval. In summary, the public space protection orders were introduced by the Anti-Social Behaviour Crime and Police Policing Act of 2014 and can be used to regulate activities in public places to ensure that the law abiding majority can use and enjoy public spaces safe from anti-social behaviour. As such, these orders provide an opportunity to enhance the Council's enforcement ability to respond to public opinion regarding dog fouling. The extent of the current public space protection orders includes excluding dogs from all enclosed children's play areas and multi-use games areas, requires dogs to be kept on a lead in enclosed memorial gardens, require dog owners to remove feces in public spaces, and require dog owners to carry appropriate respectable for dealing with the feces. Uh, finally, require dog owners to put their dogs on a lead when directed to do so by an authorised officer of any public body where, where the dog is considered to be out of control and causing harm or distress to prevent a nuisance. In the meeting on in the meeting on the 22nd of July 2020, Cabinet received a report presenting a view on the current position regarding dog, dog fouling. Since implementation of the original order, Cabinet resolved to undertake a 10-week public consultation exercise on the proposal to amend the public space protection orders to include a position, provision to exclude dogs from marked sports playing pitches. In view, in view of the impact of, of the pandemic, this was put on hold and wasn't done until an appropriate time. On the 11th of June 2021, a full public consultation was carried out for a period of 10 weeks. Uh, the results of this consultation was 85% of respondents agreed with keeping the current restrictions within the PSPOs, 53.5% of the respondents agrees with the proposal to ban dogs from marked sports pitching and 43.8% disagreed. Uh, having regard into the, into the conditions required to retain the existing provision of public space protection orders, an additional exclusion of dogs from marked sports pitches has been satisfied. The committee is record, the scrutiny committee is recommended to ask to provide any views on the draft PSPOs attached in appendix, appendix two to include the exclusion of dogs from marked sports pitches prior to present in a draft uh, proposal to Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor George. Um, uh, Gary Manford, uh, have you got anything to add to, uh, to what Nigel just said? Actually, Chair, it's Rob Hartshorn. Oh, Gary's not. <coughs> sorry, Chair. Gary's not. Um, Gary's the report author, <coughs> and he's not with us today. Uh, but I, I can answer question if there's any questions in relation to the report. But I don't have any additional comments to offer on top of what Councillor George has just outlined. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rob. Okay, members, have uh, any questions on uh, on this particular agenda item? Right, Councillor Bob away. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, clearly, um, I'm a dog owner. Um, I used to uh, play sports and also um, coaching kids and whatever. And it, it's it's not a good thing to be 
going around fields looking and trying to pick up uh, dog mess and on Sunday mornings and Saturday mornings and whatever. Uh, clearly, I'm, I'm supporting this. I got a question in relation to, of course, uh, if we exclude the dogs from the pitches, at 5.6 is going to benefit the children and the, the youth and the adults who play. But, um, and I think this might have been mentioned at the last time we discussed this, about the fact that um, applying only to mark sports pitches and the fact that they're not marked all year round. Now, most pitches will have rugby posts will be left up for all posts will be left up, but not always. And clearly they'll be known for what they are for the people who generally use the areas and the parks in their own wards or whatever. But um, when we say that obviously it makes it easier for the dog owners and easier for people like our officers who will be checking on what's going on, um, have they got to be marked is the sort of question. You know, if it's in the middle of the summer, is a dog then allowed to run on a football field, uh, make a mess if, you you, you know, uh, possibly make a mess? And as we've said about the um, the, the, the stuff that stays, stays in the, the soil for two years anyway. So, you, you know, can our officers or will our officers be able to challenge uh, irresponsible dog owners? you know, in the summertime, um, for example, on football pitches. And and, and, and another one is as well, um, is that I picked this up on, on one in Risker where we got a football pitch, Ponty Mister, and uh, it's shown on all the, you know, the masses of um, pitches that we were shown within the appendices. And that is actually a cricket field. It's Ponty Mister cricket field. So it's a marked football field as we speak. Come April, it will not be, but then it becomes a cricket field and then it's bounded, which covers the Yule area much bigger than the football field. And that doesn't have seemed to be picked up on Pony Mister um, Cricket Club. So I, th I think all the local ward members will have to view their own fields to make sure we're covering, we are covering all the areas. But, um, you, you know, um, again, it's, it's to do with um you know being able to um you know um basically to go forward with these people any time of the year not just when they're marked thank you hey thank you rob you want to come back on that uh, rob uh, yeah thank you chair yeah it's a good point councillor owen and it's it's um <clears throat> something that we've debated of course we brought this we brought a proposed order to to you um and is for scrutiny committee to offer a view to cabinet. So if it was the view of scrutiny committee that actually this should, uh, th you know, these, this restriction should apply all year round, and that's something that scrutiny uh, committee can offer. I guess from our, our perspective, we did, you know, we've ended up settling on, this is a new proposal, it's an additional restriction. So it goes, so the proposal is it already goes further than the controls that we've, we've currently got. Um, we, we want to be sure that um, dog owners uh, are clear about what they can and can't do. And um, we just felt that in the off season, uh, if the pitches aren't marked and if posts are down, then it might not be completely clear to them that they they, you know, they shouldn't be exercising their dog um, in that location. But I accept that it's an area for, uh, an area for debate. And um, you, you know, I think you, you know, to start really in my response, Councillor Owen, you make a you make a good point. It might offer clarity if um, if actually dogs are excluded from a particular area all year round, and then there's no sort of question of whether it's in season or, or, or out of season. But uh, I'm happy that you know, we would receive a view from uh, from the scrutiny committee, and obviously I would update that. I would uh, update cabinet in respect of that when we present the final um, version of the order to them. Okay, thank you, Rob. Can I come back, uh, Chair? Yes, yes, come back, Rob. Just to say, you know, just to say, I understand that there's masses of work already gone into this and there's been a consultation based on perhaps the sport pitches being marked in the wintertime or whatever. So I, I wouldn't want to put a spoke in any wheel here, but it's just that 
I think it is certainly worth consideration, particularly if 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 it's not going to uh, dig too deep into resources to 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 consider it a little bit more deeper. If that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Do Thanks, you want to you want to put an amendment forward then, Rob, for for what you were saying, or would, are you quite happy with uh, the report as it is for the time being, and perhaps that um, Rob could look into adding um, further restrictions? Yeah, I. Well, like like I say, yeah, I'm I'm whatever's going to go forward with this is I'm voting for it, but uh, I, I I just think it's 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 the one-off opportunity to you know consider everything. And Nigel's popped up, so does that mean he's coming on? <laughs> Good jack in the box. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, uh, as I say, uh, that's 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 my position on it, and um, yeah, we'll okay. see what everybody else got to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Councillor Owen. Uh, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Chair. Um, certainly, like to uh, support Councillor Owen on that. Yes, let's make sure that uh, we can't have people saying, "Ah, oh, well." It's, it's marked at some time of the year, but it isn't at the others. So, you know, you can you can forget about what uh, what I've been doing. So we don't have to vote on it. But there are views, I think, probably shared by most of the committee, if not all, uh, will certainly be uh, there for, for Rob to take back to the, 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 the cabinet at the appropriate time. So don't forget them, Rob. That's what we said. Uh, but I'd like to take the committee back because uh, I was expecting uh, Councillor Roberts actually, because he mentioned it in the pre-meeting, the the large number of uh, respondents that we had to the consultation and the very high number of those respondents who have backed these proposals. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, we need to know. How do we get such a high response? What do we do in order to make sure a lot of people come back to us and say, yes, this is the right thing to do? Thanks, Chair. Hey, thank you, uh, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor Mark Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm 100% in support of this, and I have to say I, I agree totally again with Councillor Owen as well. Um, even though our seasons stop at some point with rugby and football, my local rugby team, um, with their youth, they start training before season starts. So, in effect, they're training while dogs could be fouling on their rugby team. I personally think there should be a year-round blanket ban, and and that should be it. It would save it would save a lot of hassle. That's just my that's just my opinion. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Councillor Evans. Councillor Elsby. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, come in last. Everyone else has stolen my thunder. Um, I agree with uh, Bob uh, and everyone else who's spoken about this. Uh, I used to play cricket on uh, Morgan Jones' cricket pitch. And there are no visible markings, really. You've got a square that's cut, but if you don't know and understand cricket and you don't play it, you probably don't realise that the square has been cut. Um, and there's no boundary rope, it's just a white line. So uh, a lot of people will not understand that there is a cricket season in play and they may well walk their dogs on it. And as someone who has uh, had to dodge uh, dog excrement whilst running after a ball uh, to the boundary, it's not pleasant, um, and I think if we did a blanket all year round ban, it, people would understand it better. Uh, because at the moment, you, you know, you're leaving it to the dog owners really to say, well, you know, are we in season? Are we out of season? If we said blanket ban, that would make it much clearer and much simpler to understand. And uh, I'm all for it. And I want to thank uh, Rob for his report uh, and for all the work we've done in the consultation. Um, the response was fantastic. I dare say it was probably because people kind of love their animals a lot more than most things, you know. Um, so I, I, yeah, 100% in favour. And thanks, Rob. Hey, thank you, Councillor Esby. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor, I hadn't forgotten. I was going to mention it, but I'm glad you did as well. I'm, I, yeah, you know, we're, we're always having a panning. We're always saying that the respondents aren't sufficient. Well, it could be even better than this, but it's 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 really good compared with lots that we've done. And like everyone else, I'm happy with that. Back to what Councillor Owen said, like everyone else, I I voiced I voiced the same support. Really, we're on we're looking for cons consistency, aren't we? And consistency is something that 
helps habit, you know, and I, I maybe it's been said before, um, said previously as well. The other thing that this would do is some of our people will have to enforce this and consistency and people learning habits will should make it easier for our enforcers to enforce. So in doing what Councillor Owen suggests, we're making life a little bit easier for our workers as well. So I'll go for it as well. OK, thank you, Councillor Roberts. <clears throat> That's all the questions then. Uh, the recommendation is on page 28 of the pack that the security committee uh, Scrutiny Committee are asked to provide any views or draft public space protection order attached in Appendix 2 to include the exclusion of dogs from Mark Fort pitches prior to the, to the presentation of draft order to Cabinet for approval. Okay. Have we got a vote on this, Mark? No, there's no votes necessary no. on this, Chair. Um, the views um, will be passed on to Cabinet. OK. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Mark. Uh, next thing on the agenda is the grass cutting regime. And I think Major George is up again. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. My night tonight. <laughs> the purpose of the report is to seek the views of the Scrutiny Committee prior to a further report to Cabinet. In relation to the grass cutting regimes across the county borough and proposals to enhance and promote biodiversity following consultation with local members. In summary, members will recall that the national lockdown was imposed in March 2020. This required council to reshape and transform almost overnight to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Consequently, many of our services across the council were paused. One of these was the service of the grass cutting. The national, the national and local lockdown forced residents to interact with their surroundings in a new way. While people worked from home where they could, the local environment became a source of appreciation. And as lockdown rules, I think appreciation for the local, <coughs> excuse me, local county and urban parks, along with other open green spaces heightened, with, which benefited residents with both their physical and mental well-being. Throughout the summer of 2021, a consultation exercise was undertaken with local members to, to identify suitable areas within their respective wards, which could be allowed to flourish during the summer period. These spaces would be marked with a wooden plaque thanking residents for allowing the dedicated areas to grow into eco-friendly spaces and allow to produce abundant flowers, pollen, seeds and habitat for local wildlife. The recommendation is that the approach adopted in 2021 grass cutting season is again adopted as a standard going forward in relation to our highways verges and bypass routes where the mowing is kept to a minimum. The urban areas such as housing estates, older persons accommodation, cemeteries, etc. are maintained at the current cutting frequency. And finally, the members of the scrutiny committee endorse a list of areas nominated by local members within their respective wards, which could be allowed to flourish during the summer period. Officers will continually work with local members to identify areas as the programme is expanded. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor George. Uh, Mr. Edithon, have you got anything uh, you'd like to add to uh, the report? Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, just to say that, uh, as Councillor George just alluded to there, um, at the start of the global pandemic in March 2020, um, one of the services that were posed was grass cutting, and that uh, did have an unexpected and a very welcome impact on our local environment. And we did create habitat for wildlife and a haven for our pollinators. Um, you know, like many services across the, across the across the authority, we continually strive to transform and evolve and our ever changing needs to our communities. And we are doing what we can to support the climate emergency which the authority declared in 2019. Uh, throughout May 2021, um, cutting along 
and our highway verges and roundabouts was kept to a minimum to support the no mow, the no mow campaign. This campaign encouraged local individuals, councillors and stakeholders to help bees, butterflies and other wildlife by letting wildlife flourish on lawns and green spaces throughout May instead of mowing them. However, grass cutting still took place across, across the county borough and those points are related to our in, at point five point five in the report. Uh, members will see in Appendix 1 um, photographs which was taken along both the Risca and Newbridge bypass routes in June 21, which illustrates the success of this approach. Uh, throughout the summer of 2021, as Councillor George just said, consultation was undertaken with local members to identify areas in their respective wards. Um, these are set out at 5.8 in the report. Um, I'm also aware, Councillor Hussey, that um, you've also supplied some uh, additional areas in your ward. I'm happy to talk to you and, and, and work with you with those. Uh, but but I will say that think not exactly knowing the, the exact location of the areas from the photographs I can see. Some of them obviously are housing estates and in the report we say that we would like to maintain our current frequencies in housing estates. But um, I know in your ward there is the um, biodiversity areas that we have there on the entrance into the technology, uh, the industrial estate there, yeah. the old former Iowa factories. So there's either side of those lights there. We 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 got um, biodiversity areas there. Um, I, I have nothing further to add. If members have any questions, hey, thank you for saying it. Then, uh, Councillor Evans and Roberts, could you uh, lower your hands, please? Sorry, Chair, I thought I had. I can't see it on my screen at all. OK, no problem. Uh, Councillor Bob Owens. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Again, um, this is um, really good. Nice to keep a few areas uh, open you know, for uh, pollination and whatever. The the only query, uh, and it, I I think it was Mike um, Eddington that I sent an email to back last year or so, might even be two years ago, about um, wildflowers on verges. And um, we've got some photographs now of up in Newbridge and Risca. Uh, and it's fantastic and we need more of it. So if, if we can get more more flowers out there would be would be great. If if we can afford to do that, but um, the the only thing with the bypass is, uh, and I just want to clarify this, is that like on the roundabouts and stuff, when they do get a bit uh, grassed up, you know, like grass and whatever, sometimes it is a bit of an issue for um, you you know for for vision. So what I have seen, and I can see Mike's coming back in now, is we're cutting in so far, which then gives you that vision, and that's fine. If that's the, the if that's what we're doing, but yeah, yeah more flowers as well. Um, really great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor. When all the the bypass routes in the county but are cut twice a year, so yeah, we do, we do cut um, sight lines etc. on roundabouts, so you know it doesn't impede traffic safety. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thanks, Board. Uh, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yep. Yeah. Much of what uh, Bob has said again, actually, uh, as per the, the, the last issue. Um, one of the things, the number of councillors who came got in touch with you about particular areas uh, uh, was probably much lower than you expected. I just want to ask, can we continue doing that? And which officers perhaps are the best ones to get in touch with uh, locally in order to get something done, hopefully a bit quicker. Yes, by by, by all means, Councillor Adams. Uh, uh, as I've said in the report, we will work with local members continually to yeah. to, to enhance areas in their respective wards. Um, you can contact the local area parks officer for your respective wards, or alternatively, um, the parks and operations manager, Jonathan Davis. So for, for your ward, Councillor Adams, if you contacted Ben Parcell. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Also I, I was actually I was actually talking about Ben to some of his uh, operators uh, earlier today at the um, Springfield Resource Centre 
because they were looking for some chip-ins to go around some of their areas. So it all got sorted out face-to-face uh, oh, -face just about. Thanks. Good. good. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Councillor Adams. Councillor Ellsbury. Uh, I thought I took my hand. <coughs> sorry, excuse me. I thought I took my hand down. I am actually uh, going up. Oh. Sorry, Colin. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Bob Owens, do you want to come back in? No, uh, my hand is down as I believe it, so unless uh, it's yeah. legacy. No, I just went down. Okay. Right, okay. Okay, the recommendations are on page uh, 437 and 438, 3.1, um, 3.2 3 and 3.3. 3. Sorry, uh, Chair, Mark Evans, uh, Councillor Mark Evans has his hand raised. I think that's a legacy one, uh, Mark. Oh, no, right. my hand's not up, sorry, Chair. Not on my uh, screen anyway. No. Okay, no, sorry, I just Chair. Down, no, I'm mine yet. Okay, can I have someone to... Uh, to move the recommendation. I'll move, Chair. And Councilor somebody Adams. second it, please. Happy yeah, to second. Both two second it. <laughs> okay, Mark, can we go to the vote, please? Yes, a, a, poll should, a, a poll should appear on your screens, and I think it's there now, Chair. Yeah, thank you. That's been carried unanimously, Chair. We've got 11 votes for, no votes against, and no abstentions. Lovely. Thank you, Mark. Right. I'd like to go on to uh, item agenda number 10, um, public space protection orders, antisocial behaviour, and drinking alcohol in public places. And I believe this is Nigel George again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, then going for the hat trick tonight, no? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the purpose of the report is to update the scrutiny committee as we previously said, on the outcome of a public consultation regarding the extension and proposed amendment to existing PSPOs for antisocial behaviour and drinking of alcohol in public spaces. And secondly, to seek scrutiny's views on the variation of some existing PSPO areas to include antisocial behaviour restrictions and on the introduction of a number of new areas prior to the present present in the draft orders to the Cabinet for approval. In summary, public space protection orders were introduced by the, as I previously said, by the uh, Anti-Social Behaviours Crime and Policing Act 2014 and are used by the local authorities to deal with anti-social behaviour. At the meeting on the 22nd of June 2021, the Environmental and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee endorse a proposed public consultation on proposed extensions and amendments to the existing PSPOs for antisocial behaviour and drinking alcohol in public spaces. Public consultation was launched on the 23rd of July for a period of six weeks. This report provides details of the outcome of the consultation and proposed draft PSPOs in appendices three to five for the committee to consider prior to presenting to the uh, presenting the draft orders to the, to the cabinet for approval, the committee is recommend. Are we seeking the recommendations of committee members on the views on existing or extending the existing PSPOs for a period of three years, varying several areas, include anti-social behaviour restrictions and introducing a number of new areas prior to presenting the draft order orders to the Cabinet for approval. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Nigel. Uh, do Natalie Kenny, do you want to come in and uh, add anything to what Nigel just said? Thank you, Chair. Nothing really to add um, to what Councillor George has just said. We've gone out to consult, obviously, with the public in the summer at 127 responses. 
of those relatively um, the majority were supportive of the changes and extensions. I think 94% agreed to extend and 96% agreed to vary um, some of the existing places to include antisocial behaviour restrictions. So unless there's any questions from anybody. Yes, Chair, I'll put my hand up in a moment. Okay, Councillor Adams. Thanks, Nat <coughs> Thanks, Natalie, for that. Uh, um, I know uh, Councillor George has gone for a hat-trick of presentation starts tonight, but uh, I, I also know that uh, he's relied on many officers like you to put the real meat on the bone. So a little bit of that meat. Um, paragraph 512. And then that goes on further down into the paragraph regarding the uh, the number of complaints of ASB at Blackwood bus station, which is the nearest one to me to uh, to be able to highlight in that. Um, the kind of complaints that uh, Gwen Police have had, and most of these will be at Blackwood uh, Police Station as well. Have, have they changed over the three years? Uh, have, have they got more? Uh, inclusive of one factor, like perhaps drug taking or or drink and, and the amount of booze consumed there, as opposed to anything else? Um, in general, it tends to ebb and flow a little bit. So sometimes we'll see a peak there. Sometimes it's youth annoyance. There's a lot of youths that tend to hang around there in the bad weather, yeah. sometimes drinking. Um, sometimes they're not doing anything, but it's just that perception, isn't it, of antisocial behavior right. when people see a group hanging around there. Sometimes we have complaints of drugs, particularly in the toilets there, there's some issues. So the ones then and the PCSOs will patrol. It did tend to go quiet for a little bit, but now it's flared back up. So it is one of our priority areas again at the moment, and that is for drugs and youth annoyance. So it's both at the moment. Um, and the, the wardens are there regularly patrolling now daily at the moment just to keep an eye on things. So yeah, it is youth annoyance and drugs in the main. Okay. Hey, thank you, Councillor Owens. Uh, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor Owens. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, so between me, Nigel, and uh, Mike, I think we've logged a meeting all night tonight, haven't we? Um, yeah, question really for uh, Natalie. We had a massive pack for this. It was like 540 page was our uh, scrutiny uh, pack for for tonight's meeting and looking at this and again 100 percent ward members coming forward with issues let's extend what we need to do and everything else but i i noticed within the pack there was different wards then all the listed you know of different areas for example in my ward and, and other wards and uh, but there's there's no information within the report specifically about a lot of those wards so my question is, this extension, does it mean that it's extended in all those other areas, and then plus these additional areas which have been brought forward, such as listed Engard Railway Station and whatever? Um, am I getting that right? As I say, I had so much information to try and get through. I, I, I just want to clarify that's all. Yes, yeah, so basically um, some of the areas have been in existence for a number of years, so we're looking to extend the, all those areas for a further three years. We're okay. looking, because a lot of those areas only cover restrictions for alcohol because they were the previous DPPOs, we're looking to vary some of the existing ones to include antisocial behaviour restrictions, which will give our officers further um, enforcement powers to deal with antisocial behaviour when they're out in the community. And we've introduced some new areas. So some new areas where we've seen antisocial behaviour as a problem, then we'd introduce in a few new areas. And through the consultation, some of the responses actually suggested further areas. So we've looked at that. Um, some of them didn't warrant being covered because there was no calls to the police or council for um, antisocial behaviour, but some of them did warrant it. So we've included six further new areas as well. Right. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Owens. Um, I got my hand up. Uh, Natalie, I'd just <laughs> like to ask a quick question. Um, on um, page um, 519, um, 
There's a stretch of road at Pantside called Crossways. It's only about 50 metres long, I should imagine. I don't think there's any antisocial behaviour have gone on there, but we have had quite a lot behind uh, the shops by the circle with um, cars parking up and drink and I dare say drugs and playing loud music. Uh, the police are aware of it and they have uh, dispersed um, them for a long time. But um, I was quite surprised when I seen the crossways because it's, it's just a, a road between Central Avenue and Old Pant Road. Yeah, I am aware of that. I think, um, did you discuss it with Rob Hartshorn previously? So he's mentioned yeah. it to me um, yesterday. So I've had some discussions around that with the police today. I think previously the one listed in there is the bus shelter because there was issues with antisocial behaviour from the use in the bus shelter on um, the old, is it the old Pant Road? Yeah. Um, so it's the cross, the Pant Side Crossways bus shelter that was covered. Oh. But we are now considering whether the car park needs to be included in that behind the spa because there has been recent reports. So I am yeah. looking into that at the moment as well. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Uh, Councillor Adams, do you want to come back in? Uh, no, I, I was okay, uh, oh, actually. Oh. I, I've been looking at the, uh, the the appendix and all of those postcodes. Um, yeah, we can see that uh, information has come th from us, but no names or no actual addresses. Uh, lots and lots of postcodes which can be determined down to about 12, 12 addresses are on there, so nobody can be properly identified if they if they get uh, hold of this. So, uh, and that's the good determinant, of course, for the, the council to know which little areas uh, in streets may be most affected. So, hard work again, looking through all of that and putting it all together, Natalie. Well done. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Adams. There's no more questions then. Uh, the recommendations are on page uh, 453 and 454 five, of the PACS. Committee members of views are requested on extending the existing PSPOs for a period of three years, varying in several areas to include antisocial behaviour restrictions and introductions of members and new areas prior to presenting the, the draft orders to Cabinet for approval. Well, everybody happy with that? I don't think we've voted in on this, Mark, are we? It's just... Uh, That's right, Chair. The views, again, will be passed on to Cabinet on this one by officers. OK, thank lovely. You. Thank you very much. Just like to uh, thank members for not being too, uh, too hard on me on my first, first time chairing. And um, I'd like to wish you all a, a very good night and a safe journey home. <laughs> thank safe. you, Chair. Stay safe, everyone. Now declare the meeting closed. Thank you. Thank you, members.